On this week's 51%, we close our series on endometriosis by speaking with endo dietitian Stephanie Velakis to learn about the diet changes her patients make to self-manage their symptoms. It's not that you never have to touch any of those things ever again and you live a sad and miserable existence, but being really aware of you know, the frequency and the amount in which you eat some of those things and how they affect your symptoms are really key. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie. The whole world was a movie back then. I had my sunglasses on. I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita. I wasn't really in it. I didn't really get it. You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jesse King. Today we're wrapping our series on endometriosis, an inflammatory disease impacting roughly 1 in 10 women worldwide. As we've established over the past few weeks, endometriosis is a full-body disease in which tissue resembling the uterine lining, or endometrium, implants on organs outside the uterus, where it shouldn't be. As the resulting lesions bleed with each period, you can see a range of symptoms from painful cramps and bowel issues to damaged kidney function even, and infertility. There is no cure for endometriosis. Over the past few episodes, we've talked extensively about the different surgical and hormonal treatments used to combat patients' symptoms, but there are a lot of at-home tricks that people use to manage their pain, too. Stephanie Velakis is the founder of The Dietologist, a virtual nutrition practice operating out of Sydney, Australia. The nutritionists at The Dietologist specialize in diet plans meant to optimize fertility and support women throughout pregnancy. But Velakis also works with patients with endometriosis, and since being diagnosed with endometriosis in 2019, she now goes by the title The Endo Dietitian on social media. She says by shifting to an anti-inflammatory diet, patients can potentially alleviate some of their symptoms like pain, bloating, constipation, nausea, and more. Velakis says she knows this because she does it, and in her case, a little goes a long way. I had this overwhelming sense of pressure from myself honestly that I needed to change a lot in my lifestyle to do everything in my power to reduce the chances of it recurring for for me to you know bring the symptoms upon myself and so on and so forth I had this really kind of dialogue in my brain about that that I needed to get rid of things like gluten and dairy and never drink a cocktail again and everything had to go and that really made me quite sad because if you've ever spoken to a nutrition professional before we are probably the biggest foodies you will ever find and so uh, we are not the food police we absolutely love food and so (laughs) unnecessary dietary restrictions make us very sad so felt this big pressure and even though I knew the science and I knew the, the facts behind, you know, all of these types of restrictions and whether they were worthwhile and what the science was really saying about them, although limited because endometriosis is so severely under-researched and underfunded as a disease itself, let alone management from a lifestyle perspective. So it really took a lot for me to kind of halt that bus and, and that spiral going down that hill of everything free, fun free kind of diet and move towards focusing on what really kind of mattered. And these are the kinds of principles that I pretty much universally share with people because endometriosis is a chronic inflammatory condition and the inflammation in the pelvis is contributing to symptoms like pain, but also can damage our our tissues. Um, And for those who are interested from a fertility perspective can also harm the quality of our eggs. And so, really just honed in and and doubled down and focused on making sure I was getting enough antioxidants in my diet through colorful fruits and vegetables, extra virgin olive oil, herbs and spices, both dried and fresh, making sure I was getting in my oily fish like salmon or ocean trout or sardines a couple of times a week, or if I was struggling with that, um, seeking out appropriate supplementation and being really mindful of my excess saturated fat. So things like butter and pastries and fatty cuts of meat and coconut products. I know they're a real favorite 
uh, coconut oil, I feel like, really reached its peak popularity in like 2015, then we haven't let go of it yet. But it is dominantly still a saturated fat. And saturated and trans fats are both associated with more symptoms and more severe disease in endometriosis. So that's a particular one we want to be mindful of. And also alcohol, like reducing alcohol consumption as well. So it's not that you never have to touch any of those things ever again and you live a sad and miserable existence, but being really aware of, you know, the frequency and the amount in which you eat some of those things and how they affect your symptoms are really key. If you don't mind my asking, you know, when you got diagnosed, what were some of the symptoms that tipped you off? Um, you know, are you using these kinds of like lifestyle changes to manage more severe symptoms or were yours more on the milder end? For me, my symptoms pre-diagnosis were uh, quite subtle and mild. And if I didn't do what I do for a job, I don't think I would have found out for many years after that, if I'm completely honest. I had had years of spotting on the pill um, for no known reason, changing pills all the time because I kept bleeding through active pills. Um, I then came off the pill and I started to have very heavy painful periods, but not debilitating pain. I didn't even, I hardly ever took an ibuprofen. I worked through it, maybe a heat pack, but it wasn't bad. Like the image of endometriosis period pain that you see on the media where people are passing out and vomiting and debilitated in bed. I was extraordinarily functional, whether that was you know, a little bit of me pushing through or whether it was the symptom severity. I'm, I'm sure it's probably a combination of those two things. But I, I started to notice other symptoms. I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome before I was diagnosed with endo. I changed my diet for that beforehand. I didn't realize that I'd had urinary symptoms as well. I had pain with sex. My pelvic pain felt like lightning bolts. Like I remember I had a lot of pregnant clients, right? So they would often tell me about lightning crotch. They're like, oh, the baby's so big. I'm getting lightning crotch. And I was like, what is lightning crotch? Like I've never heard of such a thing. But they were describing this pain. I was like, man, that sounds so similar to the pain that I get. Like these little fleeting zingers. Like it feels like your nerves have been cut like a live wire. And I was like, they don't last long. Like people like take medication. And I was like, how do you take medication for a pain that lasts seconds? Like you couldn't possibly do that. I had lots of encounters with doctors who were um, dismissive uh, because of what I did for work. They kind of implied that because I saw a lot of endometriosis that would be, I guess, transposing that onto myself, jokes on them, but <laughs> it, it didn't take very long once I was very confident uh, or decently confident that it was a strong possibility. I worked in an office where I could literally cross the hallway and have access to an incredible ex excision surgeon. So I did that and I booked an appointment and I sat down and I said, these are all my symptoms. I listed them out. I think I have endometriosis. And he said, when are you free, I'll take you in. Yeah, I ended up getting diagnosed a couple of days before Christmas in 2019. So how I manage now is a combination of those things. I use diet, I use supplements, I've tried acupuncture, I've gone to pelvic physio before. I do have a marina UD as well, which I've recently just changed over. My symptoms are definitely starting to come back nearly five years on. They're not as intense, but I'm so in tune with my body. I just know that I'm probably going back and I probably need another surgery. Um, and a couple of years ago, I also decided to freeze my eggs which was a decision that didn't really stem too much from endometriosis, if I'm honest, which I you know is a decision a lot of people choose to make. But I was single at the time. I'd just come out of a decently long-term relationship. And because of what I do for work, I see a lot of people who struggle with fertility, particularly as they get older. <laughs> they all just kind of go, I wish I froze my eggs. So I was like, and I could just heed this lovely advice from all these people. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because, you know, obviously the dietologist serves primarily patients who are trying to conceive. And so I guess, like, do you have any advice out there for those who might be trying to conceive? Because I know endometriosis especially can contribute to infertility and make it more difficult. Oh, how much time do you have? <laughs> I mean, I spend a lot of time 
kind of helping people with this, but I guess the foundations are both simple and complex all at the same time. But certainly when it comes to preconception, we want to ensure that everyone is taking a prenatal multivitamin for at least three months prior to conception. So before you're even sometimes find out you are pregnant, uh, your nutrient demands are actually starting to increase. So it's very important if that's the one boring thing that people take out of this preconception chat is take prenatal vitamin for at least three months prior to conception. From a food perspective, you want to be focusing on similar, lots of colourful fruits and vegetables each day so that you're maximising antioxidants that will support both egg and sperm quality. Obviously, your leafy greens are going to have lots more folate, which is a critical nutrient to support the health of the neural tube and cell division as well. You want to be eating seafood. Studies show that two servings of seafood per week in a couple can reduce the time to conception quite significantly. You want to be having your nuts and seeds for your healthy fats, your extra virgin olive oil. Keep your saturated fats and trans fats low. It's ideal to actually completely abstain from alcohol when trying to conceive. There is a nationwide campaign here in Australia that I was part of where, you know, there's kind of this uh, commercial that's going out that's like, we're trying to conceive, we're saying we're not, we're not going to drink today and things like that. So it's trying to like more societally normalise abstaining from alcohol without people also questioning you, which I, I think depending on where you live, that could be a really big thing um, for young people. The other things are like eating enough eggs, having your iron-rich foods, you know, reducing things like soda, both regular and diet, more than seven soda drinks per week can increase your risk of infertility, reducing your takeaway foods, uh, making sure you're maintaining a healthy weight where possible, being active, and also reducing your use of plastics. Um, so plastics contain endocrine disrupting chemicals. And they can interfere with our endocrine system, which are our hormones. So using your water bottle, making sure it's stainless steel or glass. If you're taking leftovers to work with you, use a glass container to reheat. Um, trying to minimise your exposure to plastics. Obviously, we can't become the boy in the bubble and never encounter plastics in our modern day. But particularly from your food, it can make such a big difference. And there's a few interesting case studies showing that, you know, in factories where they're making lots of these endocrine disrupting chemicals, that there's much higher rates of infertility. So there is certainly some kind of link there as well. So there's lots to think about when it comes to preconception health, and it can be a little bit overwhelming, but that's why I try and encourage people to think about it a little bit further in advance than, you know, a month before and coming off the pill and then having a go, because it would be overwhelming to implement all of that within just four weeks, but over the period of three to six months, it, it can be a lot more buildable and lower pressure and less stressful. And it can become more of a lifestyle that's going to carry you forward into hopefully a healthy pregnancy and then set you up for positive habits to role model to your future child. And that's one of my main motivations for being in this space as well is because I thought I can impact, you know, a mum to be hopefully a baby's health, so their long-term health, their risk of allergies, eczema, diabetes, heart disease, obesity is all programmed from the way that their mum eats before and during pregnancy, um, irrespective of the DNA code. You can actually switch those genes on and off through diet and lifestyle changes. And then if a mum goes on to have a girl, all of that little girl's eggs in her ovaries are developed at 20 weeks pregnant. So when you're in your grandma's tummy, if you're a woman listening to this, all your eggs were being developed in your grandmother's tummy 20 weeks. That's crazy. I didn't know that. Well, all your mum's eggs. So you were technically in your grandmother's tummy, technically speaking, I should say. So I was like, cool, I get to like impact three generations of women by just helping one. Yeah, well, definitely. That does sound really cool. I know you mentioned a couple other things that you also do to help manage your symptoms. I guess aside from diet and exercise, what are some of the other things you see patients doing at home to make their every day a little bit easier? Yeah, absolutely. The pathway to any of these things is a bit non-linear for most people, but I would say the cluster of things that people explore and potentially find useful are diet and lifestyle, pelvic physical therapy, 
particularly important if you're having pain with sex or constipation or chronic pelvic pain, if any of those symptoms ring true to you and bladder issues, then definitely pelvic physical therapy. I think every endo warrior can benefit from some pelvic physio. Um, acupuncture can be helpful. I've, I've done bouts of all these things. I don't consistently do them week in and week out, but I've tried all these things. Probably the other one that is increasing in both popularity use and data is the use of medicinal cannabis, um, both CBD oil and not. I'm not a foremost expert in it at all, to be honest. I'm still learning more about it. But there's been a decent survey here in Australia of people with endometriosis and their self-management strategies, and they rated cannabis as the most effective heat as the next most effective, so heat, heat packs, for example, and diet as the third most effective for their symptom management. Others were alcohol, which <laughs> probably not the most effective management strategy. But these were kind of non-medicinal resting, breathing, meditation, things, exercise, things like that. But the top three were cannabis, heat, and diet. I think that probably speaks to the fact that people really value what they're doing day in and day out from a nutrition standpoint when it comes to, you know, dealing with a chronic condition. And I think that's why diet and lifestyle align so nicely with chronic conditions like endometriosis because they are day in, day out conditions, whether you're symptomatic or not each day. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, before we wrap up here, is there anything that we're missing that you want to make sure people know? Just those who are interested in exploring diet and lifestyle changes for their endometriosis or for it, please be careful where you get your information from. You know, I scroll on TikTok and Instagram like everybody else, and there is so much misinformation, fear-mongering, overly restrictive diets that are propagated, and it makes us feel like, and like I started this conversation, it makes us feel like we're doing it all wrong by not doing the most. And you're doing good enough just dealing with a chronic condition that is has no known cure, has, you know, really inadequate management and treatment strategies, and, you know, you're here. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. Be judicious with the sources of information you are getting for endometriosis as a whole, but particularly around diet. If you are interested, start simple then consider seeking some professional support. It does make a world of difference. The amount of times I hear people saying, oh, I shouldn't have done this on my own. I should have just come and seen you <laughs> from the jump and I regret it. So keep that advice would be my, my recommendation broadly. Um, and I know it's not accessible for everyone, but if it is an option, definitely consider it. Stephanie Velakis is the founder of The Dietologist, a virtual practice of fertility dietitians and nutritionists serving expectant mothers in Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and in the U.S. Velakis also works with patients with irritable bowel syndrome and endometriosis. You can learn more about her work at thedietologist.com and at endo.dietitian on Instagram. Stephanie, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share, Jessie. In addition to there being no cure for endometriosis, there is no known cause and no definitive method of diagnosis besides surgery. Galakis mentioned she was somewhat lucky to see an excision surgeon relatively quickly after suspecting her symptoms, but oftentimes it can take years for patients to get diagnosed and start treatment. Part of the reason we know so little about the disease is because research for it is especially underfunded, as is the case for a lot of subjects lumped into the category of women's health. In 2022, the National Institutes of Health allocated $16 million to endometriosis research, an increase from previous years, but still less than 1% of its annual budget for a disease that, again, impacts roughly 1 in 10 women worldwide. To state the obvious, women are more than half our population. 
But research on women's health has always been underfunded. That's why we're launching the first ever White House initiative on women's health research, led by Jill, doing an incredible job as First Lady. In his State of the Union address earlier this year, President Biden asked Congress for $12 billion to fund women's health research. Whether that comes to fruition or not remains to be seen. But the president did sign an executive order in March pledging $200 million for women's health, on top of another $100 million announced by the administration earlier this year. Among those who might be vying for funding are Dr. David Vorp and Isabel Chikanoski, part of a team of researchers in a new lab dedicated to endometriosis at the University of Pittsburgh. The Hub for Endometriosis Research, or HER for short, consists of a dozen doctors and scientists from the university's schools, including the UPMC McGee Women's Hospital and its research institute. Vorp says it all started when Chikanoski, a PhD student, applied for a spot at his vascular bioengineering lab. Chikanoski says she wasn't necessarily set on studying the heart when she applied. She's passionate about endometriosis after struggling with her own symptoms for years. But there weren't exactly many lab opportunities out there for endo, and she saw a chance to broaden her horizons at Borp's lab. Another reason why Dr. Borp's lab like, caught my eye was this idea of creating clinically translatable tools. I think we have a lot of really intelligent, amazing scientists who are able to crack the code on a lot of the biological questions. Uh, but my interest is creating a tool that can interface with patients or interface with clinicians. Around the time they started working together, however, Vorp learned a lot about endometriosis himself. He says his wife, Allison, had struggled with sharp pelvic pain and infertility for years, going from doctor to doctor with different diagnoses each time. Finally, she found herself at the UPMC McGee Women's Center for Endometriosis and Chronic Pelvic Pain, specifically with an excision surgeon by the name of Dr. Ted Lee. Not everybody can do this, but just from a physical exam, now, pretty invasive physical exam, she'll tell you, but uh, based on that exam, he was pretty certain that she had endometriosis. He, uh, when, when he saw my wife, she was you know, in her late 40s, and um, had told her that if you would have seen me 20 years ago, we may have been able to correct this and, and you may have been able to have children. So that was, uh, you know, very devastating for her to hear and, you know, for me too, of course, and just added, you know, more fuel to the fire uh, as far as wanting to figure out, you know, ways that we could, um, you know, address this problem. Lee recommended Allison for surgery to officially diagnose her endometriosis. And around this time, Vorp gave Chikanoski a call. He wanted to know everything she knew about the disease. And thus, the hub for endometriosis research was born. So my very niche interest is in disease prediction with minimally invasive tissues and other patient inputs. But as a whole, the hub for endometriosis covers the broad range of how can we improve diagnosis and risk assessment? Are there biomarkers that we can discover? So we have some people who are working more on the biomarker discovery side, and then we have people who are working on better methods of modeling the disease with microfluidic devices and hydrogels, and then eventually, how can we work on treatments? Chikanoski says one of the biggest hurdles to diagnosing endometriosis is the lack of biomarkers for it. In other words, you can't perform a blood test and have it come back positive or negative for endo. It also doesn't show up well in a CT scan, MRI, or an ultrasound. And surgery, of course, is not always an option for everyone. But what if you could give doctors a tool to predict a patient's risk for the disease? Like Dr. Lee's physical exam, but even less intrusive. What if you could simply feed a machine a patient's data, like a survey or their clinical history, and have it accurately predict their risk for endometriosis? So machine learning falls under the branch of AI or artificial intelligence. It's essentially this way that we can better understand the cohesion and trends between data. Um, so there's a lot of standard data analysis methods that can be used to understand a huge Excel sheet, imagine. But machine learning is able to kind of find details within that maybe we wouldn't find with standard statistical methods or that we would not see with the naked eye. So we're using machine learning for classification methods. So does this person have endo? Yes, no. Uh, if they have endo, is it 
stage one and two, or is it stage three and four? As part of her dissertation, Chikanoski is working on a machine learning tool she calls EndoDX that she hopes could be available to doctors in the future. It's still in the early stages, but so far, thanks to a number of grants, she's been able to look at roughly 115 patients with pelvic pain or infertility and says EndoDX has accurately predicted their endometriosis diagnosis about 70% of the time. Vorp and Chikanoski say they're optimistic about the future of endometriosis research. As awareness grows, Vorp says the number of studies and grants surrounding it has also grown. And at its core, they say the hub aims to keep driving that awareness upward. Having been on the patient side and now research, I always felt almost this kind of sense of hopelessness because you can't see what others are working on. And so um, we have received a lot of really, really amazing support from the University of Pittsburgh, different funding mechanisms through the Center for Medical Innovation, the uh, Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, different areas where they see potential in Indo research. And for all the people who do listen to this, I want them to know that the hope exists, that it's been amazing getting to see the support that exists for a group like us and getting to see how passionate others are in making what we're working on a reality and making the science that we're doing come to life. There is hope to be had. And I think that the world of science and endometriosis are colliding wonderfully and that there's a lot of progress being made. There's a lot of questions to be answered, but the University of Pittsburgh is now just one hub of the many that exist trying to focus on endometriosis. You can learn more about the HER at the University of Pittsburgh's website at engineering.pit.edu. Thanks for tuning in to this week's 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in Albany, New York. It's produced and hosted by me, Jesse King. Our associate producer is Jody Cowan, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Just a reminder that you can listen to 51% anytime at WAMCpodcast.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can stay in the loop on all of WAMC shows by signing up for our weekly newsletter, Airwaves, at WAMC.org. We hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Jesse King for 51%. I was every single girl, I was nobody else, I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half, he was a hollow laugh. And I lost my cool somewhere along the way. At night and on the hallway, I had to learn how to look away. Lost my cool, no electricity, hot rain on the concrete, sweet melting little girl dreams. They said, oh, I want a big life, not a house that could have been like, where are you taking me, where are you taking me?